Welcome to Hyperpolygon Activist Learn Languages Make a Difference. My name is Dr. Carlos Sierra Lopez and I'm here today with Dr. Thomas Back. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for your kind invitation. Thank you. So, we're here to discuss your many studies about bilingualism and the impact of cognitive impairment or lack thereof. And I would, of course, put the links in the description below the video so everybody can, can read the full articles. Mm -hmm. But I would like to begin by summarizing your research. How will you summarize your research in one minute? The, the main outcomes. Uh, well, I would say the main outcome is that speaking more than one language, even if it's not at a perfect level, has positive effects on many cognitive functions. So it slows down cognitive aging, it improves mm -hmm. cognitive functions and healthy aging, it delays the onset of dementia mm -hmm. by roughly four to five years, mm -hmm. and it improves cognitive outcome after stroke. Mm -hmm. So those findings are pretty solid. Well, I mean, as solid as any findings can be, sure. uh, I think one of the problems if you do observational studies is that there are a lot of confounding variables. Now, mm -hmm. what do I mean by observational studies? Now, if I wanted to do an experiment mm -hmm. and I were a dictator and had mm -hmm. 100 years of time, mm -hmm. I would then divide, let's say, 1,000 babies into one group, which will speak and learn only one language and one into those that speak two mm -hmm. or three and then 70 years later I look how they are. Right. Now obviously this is impossible, mm -hmm. I mean not only for ethical reasons but also it's difficult to get a grant for 70 years. Right. So we are dependent on what we find outside to right. start this kind of long term. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are looking at different variables, so very often whether people speak a language or not might be also associated with their social status, with mm -hmm. their religion, with their education, yep. and so on and so on. And it's never possible to control for all of these variables, but they are differently distributed across different populations. Mm -hmm. so that means if you look at different populations, at some point you can minimize their effect. Right. So one of the examples is what I would call a kind of sandwich model mm -hmm. of bilingualism, that in many societies you find bilinguals at the kind of top and bottom of social scale mm -hmm. with monolinguals in the middle. Mm -hmm. So let's say you will find in this country, in Britain, people who speak good French because they went to a school where right. French, and nowadays, by the way, Chinese is the new French, so yeah. in a way we'll be learning Chinese, so they might speak two or three languages because they went to good school and come mm -hmm. from a very, very privileged background. Mm -hmm. Then you have the monolingual, uh, so we'll say, middle, and then you have people who are maybe immigrants yeah. and then and speak more than one language because they grew up with their parents speaking yeah. or do or Polish or mm -hmm. whatever. So from this point of view, you will find the bilinguals, so to say, at the top, at the bottom. It's not only a Western phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I found interesting in Bolivia, I found something similar. Right. So you have, so to say, the elite, which will speak yeah. not only apart from Spanish, mm -hmm. English, but many of them will be very proud mm -hmm. to speak also German or French. Mm -hmm. Then you have the monolingual group in the middle, and then you have the speakers of Aymara, Guarani, mm -hmm. Quechua, and so on, which generally very often would come from more disadvantaged mm -hmm. background. So from this point of view, I think, for instance, mm -hmm. if you just compare the up and middle, it's difficult, but if you compare all three groups, then you might get a little bit beyond mm -hmm. those variables. That's very interesting. So rather than try and manufacture in vitro the erasure of those confounding, confounding factors, what you do is you find the group that already exists where that variable that you're trying to isolate is minimized. And, and, and what you said, what you said about the top and the bottom and not the middle, the sandwich model, reminds me a lot of this meme that of what is some, some regular thing that when rich people do it is suddenly cool. 
And bilingualism is one of those, right? It's like, oh, you know, the daughter of the queen speaks two languages and is sold as a newly e- arrived immigrant, but I guess it's not as cool as Ab- a abs- Absolutely that. Yeah. So if it happens, so to say, at the top society, it's cool. Yeah. If it's happening at the bottom, it is, so to say, a burden mm-hmm. for development. Yeah, absolutely. And what you say about different populations, I mean, my motto in my work is that the world is a lab. So I see myself very much as a field researcher rather than a lab researcher. Mm-hmm. So rather than trying to have everything controlled perfectly mm-hmm. in my lab, I would rather go out and look for specific communities. Mm-hmm. And then in every community you have slightly different mm-hmm. way which languages are spoken, how they are learned, how they are mm-hmm. used. But that also means that for the type of research I am doing, it's very important to understand not only the kind of cognitive neuroscience part, Mm -hmm. but also sociolinguistics. So in the last years, I got very much converted to sociolinguistics. Uh I read a lot of books. I am in touch with sociolinguists because Mm -hmm. I think in order, as Mm -hmm. I say, to get on top Mm -hmm. of these different variables, Mm -hmm. I even don't speak about them as confounding variables, Mm -hmm. but as interacting variables, because Mm -hmm. confounding sounds like there's only one thing we are interested in. Whereas in real life, we are interested in interaction of many variables, Mm -hmm. and that's why I I prefer the term interacting variables. Mm -hmm. And in relation to social linguistics, that is very important, that turn towards social linguistics, because I believe that some of the categories we're using for these studies, like bilingualism or native speakers or code switching, are categories that participate from the traditional understanding of languages associated with so-called standard language ideology, whereas those categories are often problematized in critical social linguistic paradigms such as translanguage, for instance, which disputes the perception of languages as variables that can be isolated or self-contained entities. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you or alienate the model of translanguage in this if it disputes that languages can be counted, it also disputes that monolingualism or bilingualism exists for yeah. that matter. Instead of speaking of languaging as an activity mm-hmm. that is trans trans yeah. How does that understanding can be reconciliated with studies on bilingualism? How, how neat is that bilingualism? Because one, in one of the studies that I read from you, you use subjective rating, meaning mm-hmm. self-identified yes. participants, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so how, how do you measure bilingualism otherwise? Uh, well, I mean, it's a very interesting topic, and I would say maybe my views might be slightly unorthodox, mm-hmm. but I mean, I have this kind of theory of revolutions in science. Mm-hmm. Now, in politics, if you look, and you can look at the revolutions across the world, or the French or Russian revolution mm-hmm. and so on, very often they start addressing the problem, mm-hmm. and then they are very liberating in the beginning, mm-hmm. and then they become very, very dogmatic, and at the end, end up, you know, with yeah. terror, we are now in Russian right. Revolution, say, or mm-hmm. with Stalinism in Russian Revolution. And I think there's an intellectual equivalent to mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. the, I'm absolutely behind the kind of the impulse for the ideas of translanguaging. Mm-hmm. However, the idea that there is only kind of one language mm-hmm. doesn't really take into account that if I want to communicate with people, Mm-hmm. I have to do it in a language that other people will understand. Right. So if you have, a co- if you live, let's say, all your life in a community mm-hmm. where two languages are spoken, let's say, mm-hmm. I could imagine that maybe in Miami, yeah. in Florida, it could be yeah. the case mm-hmm. where basically, more or less, you mm-hmm. assume that everybody will speak both languages, yeah. then that will be different than if I live, let's say, in Edinburgh, yeah. where, yes, I can find people speaking Polish and yeah. Spanish and Portuguese mm-hmm. and German, yeah. but they will be probably not the same people. So yeah. I have always to adjust yeah. my vocabulary mm-hmm. to the person I'm speaking with. I agree. Yeah. And I think this is often forgotten. So for yeah. me, I would say a part of being multilingual is that you have almost a kind of recognition system for partners that we meet. Yeah. Eh, mira, contigo es claro que right. podemos continuar en español y va a ser muy bien, mm-hmm. ale jeżeli dalej mówię po polsku, to będzie trochę trudniej. Portugués, tal vez, funcionaría mucho. So, 
when I speak with you, I automatically know I can switch into Spanish, no problem. I can probably switch into Portuguese, yeah. but not into German and definitely into, into German. You could. Should into you German, German probably, no, 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 exactly. No. Into German, probably yes. Yeah. I don't know. That will be to find out. Yeah, yeah. Polish will be less yeah. probable. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and that is which happens. I think yeah. in any yeah. moment where two multilingual yeah. people come together, they very quickly discover which registers of language they share yeah. and which not. I, I, I actually think it's. it's it's a paradox, so something that looks contradictory but it's not. So whether we conceptualize languages as separate identities or a unified linguistic repertoire, I think both proponents agree that there is a process of selective activation, mm -hmm. which is in your own mentioning, right? In one of your articles. And I think that people ought to be conscious and are conscious of that selective activation yeah. to accommodate their interlocutors. So yeah, I think that, that both theories can reconsider that, that fact. Yeah, absolutely, and by the way, and another scientific, or let's say a medical mm -hmm. confirmation for the selective attention is that if a multilingual person becomes mm -hmm. a little bit tired, mm -hmm. or let's say drunk, right. uh, not that I would ever know it from my own experience, then you start mixing languages. So it's not that you are less fluent, but you start speaking with incorrect people. Yeah, let's say like that, that that selective uh, activation is deteriorating. Exactly, that, exactly. That so from this point of view, I think it's very important yeah. to, to remember that in the brain we need to have mechanisms of selecting languages, so we can mix, but we can also select, right. and also going back into, so to say, let's say past, that is almost a realization saying that, you know, mixing language is always good. As far as I know from, you know, a lot of reading I did and conversations with people who do more field work, mm -hmm. ethnolinguistics, there are some communities where it's absolutely fine to mix languages, mm -hmm. in fact, it's positive, and there are some where it's absolutely so in fact the mother cannot speak mm. the language of the father because that yeah. would mean that she is kind of appropriating yeah. his ancestors. So, so there is enormous variation yeah, yeah. at the level of mm -hmm. let's say society, I mean you know what we find the most original societies in terms of language development. So I think having just one model is not necessarily correct. Mm -hmm. I think what, what I would definitely stress is that this selection is yeah likely to be one of the most important factors mm -hmm. in increasing mm -hmm. cognitive, so to yeah, say, absolutely. cognitive functions because you always need to know mm -hmm. what you can mix yeah, with. Absolutely. And just to finish the interview, I have one burning question. So when all of this is over and when the event finishes and when you go home and when you're alone with your thoughts, what is what you ultimately hope to achieve with your research and with your work on bilingualism, what is the ultimate contribution that you hope to? Well, I would say probably that most of the work I'm doing out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been working clinically for a long time and of course I'm also, I would like to, or let's say I would probably divide it like this. The research itself, I do mainly of curiosity, but I hope and I'm concerned that the results of the research should also be available and maybe show effects. So mm -hmm. from this point of view, the big questions of my research might be curiosity driven, but let's say once we found out that there's this positive effect of bilingualism, I hope very much that uh, you know, people will be encouraged mm -hmm. to speak or to keep languages. So right. it's not just about language learning. In many countries, definitely including this one, I mean UK, there is a strong pressure on immigrants, for mm -hmm. instance, to abandon their original yeah, language and speak it. only the language yeah. of the new community. Mm -hmm. Now, firstly, that kids don't really benefit from it mm -hmm. because if they speak the language of their family, they can still speak absolutely perfect yeah. English or German, I mean, yeah. whatever they need, or French. So from this point of view, you are not really giving children any advantage. We are just taking away. Yes, there's often so common this zero-sum view of bilingualism, which is not... Exactly. But there is another problematic effect, and that is when parents, for instance, get older, might develop dementia and find it very difficult mm -hmm. to speak the new language, then they won't be able to communicate with their own children. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I think this kind of policy of forcing mm -hmm. immigrants mm -hmm. 
to abandon the languages is something which is negative, right. firstly for the children, secondly for the parents, and thirdly for the society, because if you grow up with two or three languages, then you will learn any other language much mm -hmm. easier. So in a way, those people might be much more useful mm -hmm. for the society mm -hmm. through their knowledge. So in a way, it's a lose-lose-lose situation. Yeah. Children lose, parents lose, and the society loses. Right, so, so all in all, your research leads to inspire people to learn languages and to keep them, and also to further policies that make that possible. Absolutely, and I mean, just to kind of mention this inspiring, mm -hmm. one of my main interests is in mm -hmm. fact learning languages in later life, after mm -hmm. retirement, mm -hmm. after 60, after 65, and I think particularly if you look now that we spend longer and longer time of our lives in retirement. Mm -hmm. I mean, the yep. life expectancy is mm -hmm. going up, and retirement age, well, in some countries in France it went up by two years, and mm -hmm. we know not without problems, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but no comparison. So that means, in percentage, we speak spend longer and longer time in retirement, I think learning language is one of the best things we can do because it's a, very, it's a great gymnastics for our mm -hmm. brains, mm -hmm. it brings social contacts mm -hmm. and it opens our mind to other cultures and other people. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Thomas Weick, thank you very much. My pleasure.